Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second week of uh, GSE and our first uh, kick session of the week. Um, we've got Stu Francis here from uh, Hursley, um, who's going to be talking about developing and modernising Kix applications using Ansible. Um, so fairly new technology to be uh, engaging with Kix. Well, I know there's a bit of code out there now. So without further ado, um, I'll hand over to Stuart. But before that, I'll just say if you've got any questions, Stu, I'm sure you're happy taking questions, but everybody be on mute. Um, if they just want to pop a question on chat, um, Nick will keep an eye on the chat for everyone um, and might interrupt you if there's the odd question. I hope you're okay with that, Stu. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, the more questions, the better, and absolutely don't mind being interrupted. Okay, brilliant. Okay, without further ado, then uh, take it away and tell us about Ansible and Kicks. Cool. Uh, thank you, Rob. So um, the title of this session is Developing and Modernizing Kicks Applications with Ansible. And this is a bit going to be a bit of an introduction to what Ansible is and how it works, um, a bit of a discussion about how it applies to Z. And then it's kind of from the perspective of some of it's going to be a bit like, you know, how it can be useful for developers. And um, a lot of it is going to be about how um, it can enable system programmers to um, provide automated services that developers can use. So it's not um, strictly developer focused, but it's kind of a bit of both. Um, so as Rob said, there is a bit of stuff available for IBM uh, for Kicks for Ansible now, but there is actually quite a lot of content available for Z for Ansible. Um, we in the Kicks department have done our first release of Ansible support this year, um, but the IBM ZOS core collection is a bit more established. Um, the really interesting thing about the Ansible ecosystem, and we'll talk a bit about this, is that there's this big um, kind of community of um, independently developed extensions for Ansible. Uh, and the real strength of Ansible is in that community and all of the different kind of content that people are providing, which other people can reuse very easily. Um, and in particular, we're going to look at what the um, how you can use the IBM ZOS core collection with the IBM ZOS Kicks collection and how you get kind of a lot of value out of having those two things together. Um, so I'm going to go through some slides at first. And then I'm going to introduce you to those two collections for Ansible by way of a couple of demos. We have um, a samples repository, which I'll give you a little tour of. Uh, and I'm going to take you through a couple of the samples we provided for the Kix collection. So about Ansible kind of in general and specifically how it applies to Z. Uh, so Ansible is an automation tool by Red Hat, it's an entirely open source project. Its tagline is uh, turn tough tasks into repeatable playbooks. And Ansible is a, uh, you can kind of think of it on one hand as a general purpose scripting system, which allows you to um, automate a whole variety of different things. And it is really flexible in what you can automate. It works at a, um, you have control of things at a relatively low level. So doing things like creating files, writing to files, um, and you can interact with kind of almost any part of uh, your system and take a task that you previously had to write instructions down and remember how to do manually. Ansible can provide you a way of being able to automate that task. And also if you have to share that automation with everyone else. The kind of unique aspect of Ansible when compared to just a general purpose scripting solution is that it manages your uh, entire IT infrastructure. So rather than just running a task against a host, if you imagine you're just trying to do some automation with um, a shell script or something like that, you'd log into the system and then you have to make sure the shell script was there on the system and then you'd run your script. It would do whatever it was supposed to do. Um, and then if you wanted to make a corresponding change to another system, like maybe you're running one script to set up a front end web service and you're running another script to set up a database talking in kind of, you know um kind of very generic terms then you'd have to manage those two things independently ansible provides a way of saying i have this collection of machines and they're all going to be databases and i have this collection of machines and they're all going to be front end web servers and i'd like you to run this uh, automation against 
the databases one and this other automation against the front of web services one and have them kind of all kind of converge on your desired state. Um, it is a general purpose automation tool. So you can use it for automating literally anything you might think of. I mean, if you can make changes to files, then if you can do it by making changes to files, then broadly speaking, you can do it with Ansible. Um, but common use cases are doing things like um, system provisioning. So there are Ansible um, playbooks for doing things like installing um, common web server instances or database instances and things like that. Um, and um, actually standing up systems from bare metal as well, um, managing user identities, so creating new users, adding them to groups and things like that. Um, updating certificates is quite a common use case. So if you have expiring certificates, being able to like automate the process of going through and replacing or refreshing all of those certificates with newly signed ones. Um, and then it also features quite a lot in continuous delivery pipelines. So um, being part of some automated process for um, applying the latest changes to a system and for general purpose kind of configuration management. And that's the configuration management is a kind of space that we're kind of thinking about as well for Ansport. It seems like it has a lot of applicability there for Kix. Um, so Ansible is really popular. Um, I did used to have a slide in this deck which talks about how many um, independent contributors Ansible had to its repository on github.com. And I think it was the ninth most popular repository on github.com in terms of number of independent contributors, which is like really crazily popular. Um, but that figure does is a bit skewed if you've seen that anywhere because um, all of the third party content for Ansible used to be contributed to the main Ansible repository. So it kind of meant that everyone kind of converged on one repository and it kind of meant you got a lot of people contributing to that. Um, that's actually changed in Ansible recently. So there's now a better model for contributing third party content. And we're going to talk about that. And that's actually one of the real strengths of Ansible is that ecosystem and how you can share content um, within your organization or without your organization as well uh, with other third parties. And there's a whole library of useful content that you can use for Ansible or probably be something in there that's applicable to what you're doing. Um, because it is so popular, you can use it in a huge variety of places. Uh, so that includes Z now, um, and that means that you can use the same automation strategy everywhere. So people who have skill in automate in producing automated solutions on one platform are able to translate that in some way to um, other platforms as well. Obviously, we know that you know if you're going to be producing automated solutions for Z, you are going to need to have Z skill. Um, but you will also have to know things about how Ansible works as well. So there is some kind of skill crossover there, which will be kind of generally be generally beneficial if you're using the same automation strategy for everything. Um, because you can automate so much stuff with Ansible, you can achieve configuration as code. So um, if you're not familiar with configuration as code, that means having the entire state of your system represented as code in SCM somewhere so that if you needed to recreate everything, you could do it from that definition rather than having to have manually applied approaches that you'd have to go through to um, make changes to your system. So you have um, a versioned artifact that describes the state of your system. Um, in terms of that third party repository of how much stuff's in there, um, this is probably a little bit dated now actually, but um, it says over 3000 modules for all the things you might need to do. I'm fairly sure it's significantly more than that. Now, um, what it does mean is that if you're not previously aware of Ansible being used in your enterprise, then do ask around because you will find, uh, we find quite a lot that um, people that we are having conversations with uh, will be coming to us. Normally, um, you know, we'll, uh, if we're thinking about an area like this, we'll be trying to, um, you know, the table will be more flipped towards us reaching out to users and trying to find how they're going to be interested in things like this. With Ansible, we found quite a lot that actually um, people are finding that Ansible is used, used elsewhere in their organizations and they want to come and find out what we're doing on Z and how they can get the same benefit that they're seeing from Ansible on other platforms on Z. Um, and some of the infrastructure which we'll talk about, um, if that already exists in your enterprise, then that will make it a lot easier for you to get started with doing things like um, if, you, if you produce a piece of automation, having that hosted in a way that other people can benefit from it. 
Um, Ansible has a quite unique architecture in terms of um, you don't actually install Ansible on the machine that you're trying to automate. So uh, they refer to that as agentless. Um, it doesn't quite mean that you don't have to install anything. So I think agentless in some regards is a little bit of uh, uh, misdirection. Um, but essentially the way Ansible works, broadly speaking, is you run Ansible from what's called a control node. I'm gonna do a couple of demos in a minute. And in that case, the control node is gonna be my laptop in that model. So I'll be running Ansible on my laptop. And what happens is it's gonna establish connections to remote machines over SSH. Um, typically what happens then is over that SSH pipe that it's established, it transfers a Python module. So this is um, a piece of interpretive Python source code, which gets bundled up. It transfers that across to the remote machine. That Python module gets executed on the remote machine to enact some kind of state change, depending on what that um, playbook is set up to do. And when that's happened, the Python module builds a response. That response is transferred back across SSH to the control node. Um, so you will need, for example, to be running an SSH daemon on the target machine so you can establish that SSH connection. And in most cases, you'll need Python. Now, Python is not a hard prerequisite. You can implement modules in whatever you like to some extent, but broadly speaking, most of them are in Python. Um, so what happens? is you'll need to have Python installed on the target machine as well. So for Z, that means you'll, uh, the version of Python that we recommend for Z, I think actually it's a requirement now. Um, now you have to run for the IBM ZOS core collection, you have to run IBM Open Enterprise Python. And I think you can choose 3.8 or 3.9. So you do have to do some setup on the um, remote side. So you'll have to have some things taken care of to be in place on Z if you're looking to use this on Z. Um, there are some other dependencies that we'll talk about too. Um, not everything actually does use SSH and Python um, for just kind of interesting aspects. Um, we'll actually look at how the Kix connection works, uh, the Kix collection that we've developed works a little bit differently and there's the kind of reasoning for that should become apparent. Um, but you can also use Ansible for doing things like configuring network hardware and environments where Python doesn't run. So you really can use it for automating lots of things. You're not, this, the dependency on Python is not a limitation. Um, so we, I talked a little bit about how you can use, how Ansible has this model of your entire ecosystem. In Ansible terms, that's called the inventory. Um, in most cases, that can be as simple as just a a uh, flat text file. Um, so there's an example on the right hand side here, and that text file is just lists um, hosts by host name. Um, the bits in the square brackets are groupings so that you can run a piece of automation against a collection of hosts. So you can run automation against all your databases, or you can run automation against all of your front end web servers or whichever. Um, so that's how you do a static inventory. Um, Ansible has a lot of different places where you can extend it as well. And one of the uh, extensions you can develop for Ansible is what's called a dynamic inventory. So imagine you have um, a bunch of uh, provisioned instances on a cloud provider. You probably don't want to have to maintain an inventory in like, that you declare to Ansible to tell you what those um, instances are. Instead, you can get an Ansible plugin, which will be compatible with your cloud provider of choice and it will be able to look at your inventory that you have on cloud and make that kind of discoverable to Ansible so that you can pick from that inventory to run automation against. When you write Ansible, I kind of said this earlier uh, before introducing the term properly, um, your Ansible automation is described in something called a playbook. Um, that's a bit like a script. Um, it's in YAML format. So there's an example on the right hand side. Um, in a playbook, what you'll essentially do is you'll have a list of tasks. Those are the things you're going to do. And those tasks are um, some tasks are built into Ansible. So things like running a shell script or executing a Python script um, or uh, the bottom one of the, in that example there actually a template is one that's built into Ansible. Um, but some tasks are provided by third parties as well. We'll look at the mechanism by which you can get third party 
tasks into your environment so you can use them. Uh, once you've compiled your list of tasks and what you want to do, the configuration for each task is obviously going to be specific to that task. So um, if you're running a shell script, there'll be a configuration parameter will be the path to the shell script and things like that. Uh, whereas they might not be for other tasks. The top part of the playbook is where you say uh, where, kind of what hosts from your inventory you want that to run on. So in this instance here, we're saying run this against the web servers from the previous inventory example. So we have um, that binding there. You can bind to an individual host there or a group of hosts, or you can use the magic keyword all, which will run it against everything. Uh, when you execute the playbook, um, in terms of executing it, uh, we'll see an example in a minute, but you can, there are a variety of ways you can do that. But when you execute the playbook, uh, it's going to go through and look at those tasks and run them against that um, the remote systems identified by the hosts. Now, um, it is interesting that you're actually writing a declarative specification for your playbook in YAML. You're not actually writing scripts here. Most of the scripty logic ends up, you, know, you can do this a variety of ways, but typically most of the scripting logic stuff is tied up in the tasks themselves. So um, your playbook stays very high level and just has a kind of uh, description of the desired state you'd like to get to. Um, so yeah, here's an example of that shell task. So um, you'll have the, if you're running a shell command on the remote system, then you'll have obviously the command you want to run. Um, you can provide a path to a file for this task as well if you want. You can change to a specific directory. So each task will typically have a lot of configuration that you can go um, set up for that task where you want it. All of that configuration is uh, all the options that you have available are um, there's really good documentation for all of them for almost all the tasks. Um, and actually, we'll see how when you're publishing content to Ansible's central repository, there are actually um, your there are tests that run the mandate that you have. Um, Good enough documentation before your your own before you're even able to publish there. So there is there is actually quite good documentation on a task by task basis. Um, Ansible is changing quite a lot. So I would say that the actual main documentation for Ansible um, varies quite a lot release to release. So make sure you're looking at the right version so that you're getting the right documentation there. Um, when you execute a playbook, so we're going to see this example when I go through a demo in a bit, and that is going to be using the Ansible playbook command. So when you install Ansible, um, it comes with a collection of CLI utilities for doing things like installing um, third party content and um, actually executing running Ansible plays. So um, the Ansible playbook is one of those utilities. The dash i argument there specifies my inventory. So that's which um, file I'm going to use my inventory. So this is a file called databases. Um, in terms of which content from that file, that's in the playbook. So the hosts line in the playbook itself will describe that. Um, and then you can override properties or variables on the command line with dash e. Uh, there are other options too, obviously, and then the name of the playbook you want to run. Um, you're not limited to just running your playbooks from the CLI, though there are a variety of choices you can make in terms of having your Ansible automation that you've developed uh, available to other people as a service. Uh, Red Hat have an offering in this space called Ansible Tower. Uh, so that provides a, you can point it at the repository that has your playbooks in. Um, you can do kind of matrix security where you can say like this user has the ability to run this playbook and this other user doesn't. Um, and you can do things like say this user can run this playbook, but when it runs, it actually runs with this other user's authority. So they can do stuff within the context of that piece of automation that they wouldn't otherwise be able to do. So kind of typical things you'd expect to see about running automation there. Uh, you don't have to use Ansible Tower. So for example, there are uh, plugins for Jenkins for running Ansible playbooks. So if you already have some kind of instance set up for running jobs, there's probably a good chance that you'll be able to use that to run um, Ansible. Though things like Tower will be um, Ansible native 
So you'll probably have a more uh, an experience that's more aligned with the automation that you're trying to run. Um, but yeah, your uh, experience will vary depend uh, across different things. And you do have a lot of other options that aren't just Ansible Tower there if you're just trying to dip your toe in the water. Ansible Tower is one of those things I was referring to when I was saying, if you have Ansible running somewhere else within your enterprise, you might already have an instance of Tower that you can host your automation in alongside other people's automation. Uh, so that might make it a little bit easier for you to get going or um, kind of speculate about what you might be able to achieve with Ansible. So um, we kind of covered all this already, actually, and in, in like the general rules that apply to like why you might want to use Ansible all apply to why you might want to use it on ZOS. Um, one of the interesting things is because Ansible is quite general purpose, you can, it's not a case of you have to um, discard all your existing automation and start from scratch with Ansible. Um, you can use Ansible to kind of uh, wrapper an existing piece of automation. So you want to run uh, some recs, you can do that with Ansible. Uh, you want to trigger a piece of automation in system automation or a ZOSMF workflow, you can do that. Uh, you want to submit some JCL with Ansible on ZOS, you can do that and get the output and see if it passed or failed, et cetera. So, um, and you can actually use Ansible to tie all those things together. So you've got one piece of automation in system automation, another piece of automation in Rex, you can, um execute the system automation piece of work first and then execute the uh, rec script second there is actually a um, ibm authored collection for ansible for um, interacting and interactions between ansible and system automation so that is the sort of thing we're thinking about and there's one for zero snf as well um in terms of what is already available for IBM for ZOS, we'll go and actually have a look at the website in a second. Um, there's a growing set of, uh, so I've kind of said that word as well a bit without introducing, which is collections. A collection is how you publish, how you group a set of content together uh, in Ansible world for sharing it. And there's a website called Ansible Galaxy, which is uh, Galax. Uh, we'll go have a look at that in a second as well. Um, uh, and that's where those collections get hosted. Um, the collections are all namespaced. So on the right-hand side here, we're looking at the IBM namespace. So you'll be able to go to Galaxy and know that everything in this namespace is from IBM because we'll be the only people who are allowed to publish for that namespace. Um, there are CLI tools in um, Ansible for that come with the Ansible installation that say how you um, that what our utilities for getting these collections, downloading them from a remote service and installing them locally. You can do the same sort of thing that you might do with other reposit online repositories elsewhere in terms of hosting a version of that repository locally so that you're not, um, so you can control which automation people have access to. Um, in addition to Ansible Galaxy, there's actually a kind of uh, subset of Ansible Galaxy called, um, the Ansible Automation Hub. And this is a pay for service by Red Hat. Um, the distinction being that Red Hat are responsible for the service um, and support channel for all the content in there. So our Z content is also published to Ansible Automation Hub. Um, why that's interesting is not so much that, you know, you'll be able to get support for our Z content, although you will be able to go through that channel to get support for any of the IBM Z content that you see in Automation Hub. Uh, but it means that you'll be able to have the same support experience for anything you choose from there and know that all the content that you choose from Automation Hub is supported. And that's part of the um, Ansible automation platform. So that'll come with things like a license to use Ansible Tower, et cetera. Um, it is important to note, I kind of said it already, but it is important to note that Ansible Automation Hub is a subset of Ansible Galaxy. So not everyone who publishes things to Ansible Galaxy will also go through the process of um, setting up an agreement with Red Hat so that their content can be published to Automation Hub. There are additional restrictions about the content that gets published to Automation Hub in terms of um, the, um, I mentioned that when you publish to Galaxy, things go through tests. There are even more tests that things go through when they're published to Automation Hub. It's independently hosted documentation. So it is a little bit of a different experience. You might find that um, because of those tests that some parts of that experience are more like guaranteed um, 
you'll have the same uh well you the support model gives you the guarantee that things will be reliable in terms of using it in terms of it running but um there are a lot more tests that go on in terms of validating the documentation matches the specification for the modules and things like that um the ibm zos core collection which i'm showing on the right hand side here and we'll go have a dig around on the galaxy website uh provides a really good foundational experience for zos so uh has you can see the number of modules. Each module essentially provides a separate task. So there are 16 kind of different things you can do with the ZOS core collection. You can do things like um, submitting jobs, reading job output from JES, um, allocating um, cataloging data sets, uh, and running programs. One, I think one of the more interesting ones actually is running programs without having to use a job so there's some kind of sugared experience that allows you to kind of skip the skip defining the jcl side of things a bit and we'll kind of we'll try and have a look at that as well uh this year at start of this year we released the first version of our kicks collection for ansible so this is something that's relatively new to us that we just started doing but it is something we're continuing with as well so we are thinking about kind of what to do next in this space um so the collection is being developed in the open. So this is an open source project as well. So if you go to um, github.com, what's kind of interesting about Ansible is I mentioned that they moved all of the third party content out of the Ansible repo um, and into this separate Ansible collections organization on GitHub. So that's the Ansible dash collections part of the URL. Um, ours then goes in a sub in a repo in that organization called IBM ZOS Kicks. The IBM ZOS core collections develop the same way as is the IMS one. They're all under Ansible collections or just kind of interesting if you've worked in uh, kind of open source space before, because typically you'll see like, um, you know, the IBM content hosted by an IBM org, but this is the way that Ansible collections work. So now everything's out of the same repository, but it's in the same organization. Um, on galaxy.ansible.com, we're under the IBM namespace and IBM ZOS Kicks. And our collection actually is now part of the supported Red Hat Ansible certified content for IBM Z, along with most of the rest of the Z content. It's normally when stuff arrives. So our stuff now is simultaneously published to Galaxy and Automation Hub. If you're seeing new things show up for Z, it's possible they might show up in um, Galaxy first and then go through the certification process and arrive on. Um, automation hub slightly afterwards. So um, in terms of what's in the Kix collection, our first stab at this is making it, uh, we have the CMCI API that's provided by CPSM. You can run that in your individual Kix regions as well. Um, and we have provided uh, some wrappers for that for Ansible to make it easier to do things like build CMCI requests and interpret the responses so that you get back, uh, so that your playbook can detect whether or not that. Um, so we'll detect if your request passed or failed or whichever, and then parsing the response, getting the output into a format that you can use in your playbook to pass to the next task and things like that. So making it a bit easier to handle all of that. Um, we thought that was a really good place for us to start because there's a lot of utility in the CMCI API. Um, kind of gives you the opportunity things that if you've used Kix Explorer, things that you can do in Kix Explorer because all of the data in Kix Explorer is backed by CMCI. So any of the Kix resources you're looking is backed by the same API that you can drive with Ansible now. Um, you can now choose if you have a task that you go through repeatedly in Kix Explorer and it's a few steps like you define one resource here, uh, you define another resource there and connect them together by referring to each other or something like that. You could create an Ansible script now, an Ansible playbook to do that for you so that you wouldn't have to uh, repeat that manual task yourself and you could empower someone else to be able to do it as well. So um, we cover the whole of the CMCI API. So um, getting information about any resource, so like installed programs or files or transactions, but you can also um, get information about the definitions that back those as well. So you can get definitions from CSD or from BAS if you're using that with CMCI API. Uh, you can also update those definitions with our update task, delete uh, installed resources or delete definitions. Um, and you can run any of the actions that CMCI supports against resources. That'll include things like new copying or phasing in a program, 
scanning a pipeline, actually installing a definition, that's an action. Um, all of this is in the same way that it is in Kix Explorer. This is all still subject to CPSM security. So um, turning on the API doesn't necessarily grant everyone access to be able to do everything that the API is able to do. And there's quite exhaustive configuration options you have in CPSM for restricting which operations people have access to. Um, so let's look at a really simple scenario. And I quite like starting with this scenario because um, it actually means a lot of that remote installation I talked about, about setting up Python, et cetera, you actually don't have to go through uh, because of the nature of the way it works. I kind of alluded to this earlier. Um, because we're using an HTTP API in terms of um, CMCI, um, it doesn't really, it's not really necessary for us. If I'm running Ansible on my laptop and I'm targeting ZOS, um, it doesn't really make sense for me to have to establish an SSH connection to that machine. So that machine can make an HTTP connection to itself to do something when I could just kind of cut out the middleman and make the HTTP connection straight away. Now you do have the opportunity to do it both ways. If you want to do it the second way, um, you might want to establish an SSH connection and then use that to make an HTTP connection. Uh, what this does mean is we have to specify some authentication information because um, normally over SSH, we'd use our SSH identity to verify who we are. We're now going to have to verify our identity over HTTP. So you'll see me uh, needing, being asked to supply username and password as well. Um, and there are that might be one of the interesting ways that you might want to um, you might want to go over SSH first. You might go over SSH for the first hop and then be able to use something to uh, bounce your SSH identity to a credential you could use for HTTP instead. So using the same identity for everything. Um, but you do have the flexibility to kind of pick and choose. What we're going to do in this scenario is we're going to use the CMCI API to collect some information that you might have seen visible in Kix Explorer. Uh, you have maybe you go through a report process where you um, take that. So if I kind of I come out of here and I show you in Kix Explorer some of the things that people use Kix Explorer for. Um, so they might take some of this information here that you have visible in Kix Explorer and then do Command C to copy it. And then you can come over to Excel and you can create a new um, blank workbook. And I think Excel just crashed. Start it again. There we go. Um, you can paste the contents that you see in Kix Explorer into here, and then you can kind of, you know, reorganize it, sort it how you like, design the content how you want so that you can produce some report. Um, the problems that you have with doing this in Kix Explorer is we've obviously only copied the data that you could see um, in the table at the time. So if you had like, normally you were looking at one set of stuff, but in your report, you want to see different content that you have to come in here and add more data that you might want to see. So you might want to see the initial heap and the heap occupancy. So you might choose to add those. This is a JDM service in Kix for reference. Um, then if I selected this information instead and copied that, you'll see that I get like a slightly different subset of stuff. So Ansible, we're going to go through an example where we can automate this process instead. Um, so I mentioned that this is one of our um, samples that we have in our repository. We hop over to um, here. This repository, if you search for Z Ansible collection samples, this is a shared playbook repository which we have on github.com. So this is public on github.com. Uh, this is where we put all of our samples that we're developing for all of the IBM Z content for Ansible. So you can come in here and find something that will kind of teach you how to use a particular aspect of um, our Ansible content for Z. So that's not just Kix. You scroll down in here, there's a little kind of guided tour which will teach you about using Ansible to do different stuff in here. And there's a whole load of different examples. We're going to be looking at examples in the um, Kix section, which is under ZOS subsystems. So if you scroll down, you can see there's a Kix section here. If you come in here, we have like a little front page which teaches you, which talks about all of these samples. We're going to go through, the first sample we're going to go through is this one, and then the second sample we're going to go through is this one. So the first one is retrieving operational data from running Kix regions. So kind of what I just showed in Kix Explorer, we're going to automate it in Ansible so you can provide it as a service to people so that every time you wanted to generate the same report, 
you could run that Ansible playbook and get that generated. Um, the best way to get started with this is to clone, if you want to have a go at this, is to clone this entire repository. And then this, that's what I've done here. Then CD, I change directory down into like the um, right one. So we're looking at the CMCR reporting. So change directory locally all the way to here. Um, and then each of these samples comes with a readme that will take you through what the sample does, what requirements it has. Um, these requirements that we have here are actually local requirements. So I've already been through the process of installing Ansible locally. When you install Ansible locally, it's actually a Python module. So you'll want to install Python first. Um, at the moment, Ansible supports Python 2.7 onwards, um, but they will be dropping support for Python 2.7 in newer versions of Ansible uh, kind of coming up. So you might want to just start with Python 3. Uh, so. Uh, but on ZOS, you actually do need Python 3.8 on, on the host side. Um, so in terms of kind of what that looks like, I've already installed Python. That will vary depending on which platform you're on. You can kind of Google how to install Python in your different environments, or maybe your um, enterprise has set up a way that you can install a distribution of Python easily for you. Um, I'm using uh, Gnu's VS Code to go through this, by the way. Um, Uh, but I'm actually going to use the terminal. This is an embedded terminal in VS Code. So this is exactly the same as if I was over here in the regular terminal. But this is just embedded in VS Code so we can see it alongside the playbook for the purposes of this demo. Um, we are going to run this report YAML here. This is our Ansible playbook. So if we scroll up to the top, you'll see there's some information reproduced in the readme. So you can see that in context here. You can actually get the readme as well. Um, and I've already been through the process of installing Ansible. If you have Python installed, but not Ansible yet, you can be hit install Ansible to install that. And that will come with all of the Ansible CLI utilities that you need. We've already done that here. We're just going to try running this playbook. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to run Ansible dash playbook. Um, and then we're going to run um, report. Now, in the example I provided before, you notice I specified for inventory. One of the reasons I suggest this sample is a good way to get going is because you kind of don't have to worry about all of that. Um, this example is set up to prompt you with all of that information about which remote system you're going to run it against. Because we're not doing SSH, we can just prompt for thing for like HTTP hosts and ports uh, as part of the playbook. So when you try running it, um, you'll notice that we're bound. I said there was a special word you can use for hosts, which was local host. There's a special word you can use in here, which is hosts all. Uh, sorry, I said there was a special word you can use, which is hosts all. We're going to use local host. And what that means, don't run on anything from my inventory. Actually, you don't need an inventory. I'm just going to run it on the local system. Um, then we're going to start prompting for these variables. So I'm going to point this at a kick system that I've got running in Hursley. And then a port. Uh, this is actually HTTP, not HTTPS, but you can do either. Uh, oh, hang on. Hit enter twice there, sorry. Let's do that again. And uh, then my context, that's the name of my Kixplex in CPSM. So that's Kixx56. Uh, this is actually set up to be unauthenticated, but you can specify a user and password here uh, in terms of how this report works. You don't have to do it this way. So you can pass those in as properties or you can use, there are various ways that you can have those encrypted in Ansible as well. So there are proper ways of doing this, which I'm not bothering with for the case of this simple sample. This is actually running against the system has authentication turned off for convenience purposes. And then you're gonna see it run through the steps in the playbook against that target system. Um, now, we're going to go through all of these steps and I'll explain to you what they do. We have some dependencies here, which we need to install for um, which the CMCI module needs. And these are documented if you go look at the doc for the CMCI module. And this just shows how you can install those as part of your playbook. So these actually get installed locally. So like Ansible is a Python package. 
these are all additional Python packages that we require. So this is going to get them from a remote Python repository. And again, you don't have that doesn't have to be on the public internet. That can be um, behind your company firewall in a private instance somehow as well. Um, then kind of the interesting part of this sample, we're going to actually use the CMCI module to uh, get the information from the remote regions. This syntax here with the quote and the double brackets is how you refer to variables in an Ansible playbook. So these are the things that I was prompted for when I ran the playbook up front. So we're going to specify the context, the CMCI host, the port, uh, the user and the password if they were supplied. This syntax here where you do the pipe of the vertical bar and the default omit means actually don't specify that parameter to the module if the user didn't specify a value for that. So that's how you kind of leave stuff off. And the scheme is whether it's HTTP or HTTPS. This type here is the CMCI type for that, um, the CMCI resource we're after. So we're actually getting information. I showed you in Kix Explorer, I showed you getting information about uh, JVM servers. We're actually going to get information about our Kix regions here. Then we save the output in this using this register result. And there's a debug bit commented out here, and we're going to uncomment that and rerun it again in a second. It'll show, you, it'll show you kind of what's going on as your playbook runs. So this will show us the result from the previous step. Uh, then we're going to use the built-in template module. And this is one of the real strengths of Ansible is the built-in templating is quite comprehensive and you can achieve quite a lot with it. Uh, it uses a templating language called Ginger, just spelled with a J. So if you Google Ansible Ginger templating, then you'll find in, uh, a lot of useful documentation about how to do the kind of, um, it is a, it is its own syntax. So you probably won't have written templates with a syntax that looks quite like that before if you've not used Ginger before, but it is reasonably flexible in terms of um, being a general purpose templating language. So I've seen quite a lot of samples where people have done that too. Um, you have a template which builds a uh, JCL job and then uh, you can use the ZOS, uh, IBM ZOS core module to submit that job. So you're doing, doing things on that building content dynamically. Uh, the template, we're using a file here called csv.j2, which comes with this repository. This is more of kind of what you saw in the playbook in terms of that double brackety syntax and vertical bars. Um, the percent sign is how you do um, conditional logic in Ginger templates. So um, Taking you through this quickly, what we what happens is when we run the CMCI request, we get a list of records back and we're going to go through each of those records. Then we have a separate list of attributes and for each of those attributes, we're going to use this kind of array uh, notation here to pick that attribute out of each record. Um, and then we're going to comma separate it. So we're going to end up with a CSV file. And then if it's not the last line, we'll add a new line on the end. And that's the end. So relatively simple template. In terms of what those list of attributes are, you might have noticed as I scrolled down, there's a separate variables thing set up here, which we didn't get prompted for. So this one was a vars prompt section. This one is just vars. This is going to let us go through. Um, so this is how we specify which attributes we want. So if we quickly go and have a look at that CSV file first, um, if I go to finder. I should have it ready to go. So this is the CSV file that we just wrote. So if we open that with Excel, then you can see we get something quite similar. Um, now, obviously, if you wanted it to be exactly similar to what you got in Kix Explorer, then you could write a more sophisticated template than what I have. Mine just spits out a CSV file with the values of the right attributes here. Um, if you do have a go at running this sample, um, the readme suggests some other things that you can do so if we pop back over to this readme, if you scroll down here, there are some things you might want to try instead, uh, like next steps to kind of get used to running Ansible. So instead of specifying all the variables on the command on uh, being prompted for them, you can use this dash E syntax to specify them as well um, so that you won't get prompted for them anymore. You could also go in and remove this VARS prompt section and just stick all of the information about this hard code in your playbook in the VARS section. We're going to do one of the suggested things, which is how you can add more attributes to your report. So you just need to get an attribute name. Now, these attribute names and the resource names are, you'll need to get them from the CMCI documentation. If you read the documentation for our Ansible module, then um, 
you can there are links you can click to find the right part of the CMCI documentation. One of the things that's quite useful with this sample is if you uncomment this um, debug section here, then if we rerun this playbook. and not mess it up this time. If we rerun this playbook, then we'll see, um, we actually get a lot more information printed out. Uh, this actually, when, when we get the information from Kix, we get every attribute that's available on that. So we're gonna add, let's add the um, welcome text. So if we take that attribute name from there and we add that to our list of attributes, then we'll see that in our report. This is the uh, YAML syntax for how you define a list, by the way, if you've not seen that before. So if we try and be on this playbook now, see um, it detected that the report had changed the content this time so when it ran it actually overwrote the file that was there before and if we open this with Excel again and then let's close the previous one uh, then you can see that our report also has the welcome text for the regions in there as well um, actually, you can see there's a bug in this template because the welcome text contains a comma. It's messed up the CSV. So you'd need to, if you wanted to fix that, you'd need to escape the values in CSV by uh, quoting it, which is the thing you can do. Um, so to finish off, uh, let's look at how you can combine the Kix collection with the IBM ZOS core collection. Um, so we're going to do that by looking at our deploy program sample. So in terms of where that is in our repository, we're going to go back up to the CMCI level into deploy program. And again, there's a readme which will kind of take you through this as well. Um, what I'm actually going to do is introduce you to how collections get installed as well. Um, you might have noticed in my previous playbook, I had, if we look in this new playbook, so we're going to open the deploy program YAML. We have this list of collections. This is references to uh, those entities from Ansible Galaxy. You need to have pre-installed those on your local machine. So the collection Ansible itself and all the connections need to be installed on the control node. So that's my laptop in this case. Uh, the way you install those is with the Ansible Galaxy command. Now I've already been through and done that. Uh, but it's Ansible uh, Galaxy collection install ibm.ibm0s kicks or something like that. And that is um, going to go by default to galaxy.ansible.com, retrieve that collection and put it somewhere on your system where Ansible will know to find it when you run it. Actually, that turns out to be um, in, um, it's in your home directory under .ansible. You go in there, you can see there's these collections which I've previously installed, which are in here, and that has all the content that's been retrieved from Galaxy, so it knows how to run it. But you can see they're just uh, going to be Python modules, etc. in there. So here's all the CMCI ones I was just using. So we've already installed those. IBM ZOS Core has an additional dependency that needs to be installed on Z for it to work. It uses a tool called Z Open Automation Utilities. Now, Z Open Automation Utilities. Um, is a collection of Unix system services programs, which uh, run, um, which allow you to interact with ZOS resources from USS more easily. And the IBM ZOS core collection is Ansible wrappers. In a lot of cases are Ansible wrappers for those ZOAU utilities. So if you look on galaxy.ibm.com and you go look at the IBM ZOS core collection, um, actually, if you're on Galaxy, all of these have the link to the docs site. And if you go over to the docs site, um, that is a shared docs site for all of the Z content. So you can see on the left, there's the Z content for Kix and the Z content for ZOS Core. If you go look in the requirements section, it'll tell you what you need to have set up on your remote system. So this is the control node. This is what you need locally on your laptop. The manage node, each collection might have different requirements. ZOS Core has an additional requirement for this Z Open Automation Utilities. 
Um, there's a PAX file you can download for that and uh, decompress. And then there's a few installation steps you need to run through to get that to work. Um, Z Open Automation Utilities is independently quite interesting if you're wanting to run commands locally um, from Unix system services to do ZOS things. And you can use that independently in things like bash scripts or whichever. So um, I've got that installed in, um, in my home directory here. Uh, so you can see there's a, if we go into the bin directory, then you can see there's a whole bunch of different utilities in there. So the D things are doing things with data sets and the J things are doing things with jobs. Um, and you can run MVS operator commands, et cetera, et cetera. There's a whole bunch of uh, really interesting utilities in there, which the Ansible collection is wrappering. Um, so there is also some setup you need to do in terms of configuring Ansible to run in the correct environment when it runs. This is why it's good to start the reporting sample because you don't have to go through all this. You can kind of get up and running a bit sooner. Um, in this example, I'm actually going to use an inventory. So I'm running against a system in Hursley here. This is my user. This is where I've got Python installed. That's a vir Python virtual environment. If you know what one of those is, that's using one of those in my uh, user directory. Um, we also need to set up the remote environment so that the ZOS core collection knows how to find um, ZOAU when it runs. Um, and we're going to use a concept called host files for that. So host files is a mechanism in Ansible where you can associate uh, variables in your playbook which have different values per host. Uh, so we might say on one ZOS system, ZOAU is installed in one location, but in a different system that's installed somewhere else. Um, and what we have in here, actually what I've done in here is I've actually added some of those CMCI parameters that we were using in the first example. You can just as equally specify those if they vary per host, you could choose to put those in host variables as well. Uh, if we scroll a bit further down, we'll see I've got a dictionary of environment variables here. So this is like a map of key value pairs. And I'm going to pass this whole thing as my remote environment. So this is just saying, um, setting up these environment variables that Z Open Automation Utilities needs set, like Python path points to within ZOA use install directory to a lib directory. Um, lib path needs to be set, and then you need ZOA use command line utilities that I just showed you that bin directory uh, on your uh, shell path as well. And then there are some other options about doing automatic code page conversion, uh, like BPXK auto CVT that you need turned on as well. Uh, all that is documented in the ZOS core documentation. If you click through that, there are samples that you can just grab. Um, and I had the path to uh, where Python was installed and where ZOAU was installed set at the top of this environment variable. So I just referred to them a bit lower down. Um, what that means is all my environments are already set up so that when I run it, let's talk a bit uh, before I run out of time about what this sample actually does. So we're going through, it's, it's not a particularly sophisticated example, uh, but we're gonna go through a scenario where we might have a uh, automated build process which has compiled a load module and I want to copy that into one of my data sets that's being used as a load library by my Kix region. And once I've done that, I want to run a new copy or a phase in on that program in my Kix region to get Kix to reload the latest version of that load module. Um, you can see here, we just bind this to all. So this is gonna run against whichever remote system we point it at when we execute from the command line. First thing we do is we're gonna use this ZOS copy. This is from IBM ZOS core. So um, it's going to find this automatically. I could also have referred to it as ibm.idm.zos4.zos copy as well if I wanted to. Slash in the wrong place there, but you get the idea. Um, so I could refer to it like that if I wanted to go for a full name so it would be less ambiguous, but it will try and find a version of something called that from the path. So we have two parameters here, which is the uh, data set that's kind of the output from the build in this scenario, and then a data set, which is my load library, which I'm going to copy it into. And then this is here, we've got a regular bracket, if you can pick that out. Um, so we're doing, we're referencing a member of that data set. So we're copying remote source, just means the source is remote. So you can use this to copy files from your local system into data sets or into HFS. 
um, or you can use it to copy between uh, remote targets in HFS, uh, in datasets as well, or, or yeah, Unix system services too. Once that's done, we're going to go through the same step we went through in the previous playbook where we're installing the CMCR module dependencies. So they're the dependencies that we need to make the CMCR requests. And then we're going to use the CMCR action module to new copy the program in our Kix region. So you can see this all looks very similar where we're reading all this from properties. We actually have a scope. So this is a region name as well. So we're referencing a program in a particular region. Um, and then we have a host and a port. And then we specify the action name as new copy. Um, and the type is Kix program. Again, you can go look at that information from um, our documentation. We'll have a link through to the um, CMCO resource names documentation. We can find the right resource name to put in there. And then we have a filter set up. So we're filtering for a program with the correct names. So we're only going to new copy our target program. Um, and there are also loads of good examples in our documentation of how you can use um, the filtering. Uh, you can do some, you can do, you have the full expressive, expressivity of CMCI resource filters. So you can do like, you know, starting with or not starting with, you can and and or stuff together as well. So there are ways you can do that. This is a very uh, simple filter syntax for this, uh, this program. Um, so uh, if we actually go look at our host files again, we can look at what the variables were that we're using. Our program name is set to EYU 9xDJG and our Kix region. We're looking at the same Kix flex we were before. Our Kix region is IYCWEMW2. So if we're connected to that system in Kix Explorer, we are, we go look at that program. So this is the same thing as in if you're in Kix Explorer. Um, Uh, then you could have done this by finding this program here, right clicking and doing new copy, clicking OK and going through that. Um, if we add new copy count, then we should be able to run this and see the new copy count go up. So it's on one at the moment. If we come back over here and we run this playbook, so we're going to need to change directory. We're going to need to change the directory in that terminal here into the deploy flow program folder. And then we're going to run Ansible playbook. I uh, should have it saved actually if I do. Deploy program.yaml. So um, it's wrapped slightly unfortunately on this line. Um, if I just make it smaller so it goes on one line, then we can see it. Uh, what we have here is we're doing. Ansible playbook again, dash I, we're actually specifying an inventory file this time. So it's going to pick the inventory from our inventory.yaml, which is uh, pointed at our remote host. And that's because the ZOS core collection is actually going to run over SSH. Um, the CMCI module, we actually have that set in our playbook to run on local host still. So that's running the same way it was before. If we run this, we get very similar style of output to what you got before, except it's obviously doing different things. We'll see it go through the different steps. And then if we come over to Kix Explorer and you refresh, we'll see the new copy counts got to demonstrate that it's done the same thing. But we're able to produce an automated process that kind of transcends both those worlds and does something different. Um, if you're interested in that, those samples are a good place to get started with. Um, there are another couple of samples in our repository and a whole load more samples for generic ZOS stuff as well. Um, there are links to all of this in the slides. Um, so there's links to the Kix collection on Galaxy and our reporting sample. Um, I think I'm just about out of time. So I've ended just about on time, hopefully. Um, if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to stick around for a few minutes and answer those. Hi, Stu. No, uh, there's been no questions in the chat through. through okay. It, so. but Great. No, thank, thanks very much, Stu. There's a, there's a lot of content there and I think once we get our heads around the scripting and doing the Ansible stuff, there's a lot of sort of systems programmer heaven. Um, yeah, the ZOS, the ZOS core collection in particular is really powerful in terms of what you have available. Um, the, uh, my kind of, the really interesting one, I think, is this MVS raw 
module, which lets you run a program like it's a job step, but without the JCL. So you can still do uh, DDs and all the different types of DD that you might do, uh, but you can have all of that content in kind of feels like it's in native Ansible as well. So it makes it quite accessible to people who don't already know JCL. So that's quite interesting as well, I think. Yeah, I think it, it just sort of having the right collab between someone with the skills for this and someone with the mainframe skills and, and we can learn off each other. Yeah, and that's yeah. definitely something we've seen a lot of um, internally as well with teams of um, like relatively early tenure hires being able to get up and running with ZOS a bit faster because um, the technologies they're using in Ansible to automate things are a bit more familiar to them. So it just lets them hit the ground running a bit sooner. Brilliant. Okay, well, um, thanks very much, Stu. This is um, session 4AS. Um, I encourage everyone to fill in their feedback forms. I don't know what you win. Rocket ship flight with Jeff Bezos or something like that. <laughs> an iPad. Um, so uh, please, please do your feedback. Uh, and we're back here um, in half an hour in the same virtual room, virtual room four, session four, four AT with Chris Hodgins. who's going to talk about resource configuration in Kix. Thanks very much again, Stu, and um, best of luck. I can see you've got a lot, lot of work ahead of you <laughs> all of this. Thanks for listening, everyone. Cheers, Stu. Cheers. Bye-bye, everyone.